Julie, thank you so much. And uh, that is a perfect segue into this conversation uh, with uh, Dr. Kanayo Nwanze. Before I turn to our conversation, let me also mention how, for me, what a great honor and a great pleasure it is to have this chance to have this conversation with you. It almost feels like it is a one-on-one -on -one with you, Kanayo. And uh, that is so rare and so precious. Um, but uh, it, it's a um, great honor and a great privilege to have you here with us at Free for this conversation. So your book, Bucket of Water, is a very evocative title. And tell us more about the African parable and what it means to you. Why a bucket of water? Thank you. Um, please oh. the mic. Thank you, Raju. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thanks, Julie, um, for, all of, for making my work easier, my, my job easier. Uh, four messages to take home. Uh, first of all, allow me to thank uh, a lot of uh, colleagues and friends that are here. I haven't seen for months. Uh, so this must be a very attractive uh, venue, <laughs> event. Um, I'm really glad that you've taken the time to uh, to join us here this morning. And again, thanks to CSIS and to IFPRI for co-organizing this event. Um, a bucket of water. Well, this actually is a Nigerian proverb, and it's, uh, it's in several Nigerian languages. And uh, I remember as a child, you know, my mother in particular always saying, you know, go fetch your bucket of water in the stream. You have to do it yourself. And uh, over the years, I, 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 as I went through life, uh, it became much sharper to me. Uh, it's, in many ways, it's about destiny. And so you ask the question, what has water got to do, a bucket of water got to do with the destiny? But if you're looking at that bucket of water coming from a stream, like a stream of life, and that every one of us on this earth is in many ways walking towards the stream to collect their own bucket of water. But the lesson here for me is that uh, the stream or the stream of life is always flowing and no one can ever take your own bucket of water. The water that you will collect will be yours when you decide to walk down to the stream with your own two legs or feet. When you get there, you have to bend down, dip your bucket, and the water that enters or that you collect, that you fetch, is your water. <coughs> if somebody got there half a second before you and collected water, that is their water. It's not your water they're collecting. <laughs> because the stream is always flowing. <clears throat> and when I look at my life, what has happened, the Biafran War, how it affected us, how we escaped death, how I escaped death by not joining the army because the, the city where I was living was overrun by the federal army the day I wanted to join the army. And uh, how I ended up in the university three years after my classmates in high school had grad were graduating, the year they were graduating, and so on and so forth. But then my career took me to Congo, uh, then Zaire in 77, and to India, to, I mean, to the Sahel, to India, for and so on and so forth. I, and I ended up my career, well, my second career at IFAD, as president of IFAD. My wildest dreams. But you see, what, it, what, it, what that tells me is that, <clears throat> and through the work we've done at AFAD, I realized that that's basically what the rural people are, are doing. Every rural person is walking down the strip to collect a bucket of water, no matter how small the bucket is. And that our business is to support them to get there, to make sure they have a path towards that bucket of water, towards that stream. And so in the chapters of the, of the book, we actually in, my, in the preface, in the preface of the book, which I wrote, the very first paragraph talks about this, par this parable. And it goes on through in other, in, other section, in other chapters and sections of the book. It's as simple as that, a bucket of water. And of course, <clears throat> when, you, when you understand what we're talking about here, agriculture, farming, smallholder agriculture, it's women in Africa. So I think it's, Actually, for me, it was an honor uh, that we were able to identify this picture at IFAD as the cover of the book. 
Kanaya, thank you. You, you started to talk about EFAD, and uh, you have been president of EFAD for eight years. You have traveled the world, not only with EFAD, but even because your years before EFAD, advocating for smallholder farmers, for poor rural people. You started to talk about why it was important for you to write the book, but perhaps you just uh, uh, go further down this road. Why now? Why at this stage? And what is it that you want to convey? Well, you know, if I like, if I like several other agencies on the UN or institutions of the CGIR, we do put out annual reports, and publications, and they last for as long as that year, <laughs> or until the next version comes out. But never, nobody ever actually thought of putting together experiences into a book, into a library. Let me put it that way, and. Um, Several trips I did with uh, Kevin Cleaver, who was Associate uh, Vice President of AFAT. Uh, I, I begged him to stay longer than his retirement. <laughs> uh, we met with presidents, with prime ministers, as you mentioned, Julie. Had interactions with them, went in the field, met with rural people, women and men and children. And the more, I, the more we, we had these experiences, I realized that, you know, all the speeches I have given, all the commentaries I have written, publications in journals and articles, newspapers, uh, dozens and dozens of keynotes, and each of them was telling a story. And we thought, well, let's capture this story in this book. Because it's a story about, not about me by any means, it's a story about rural people, poor rural people. It's a story about of Ifat. And putting them together into a book to demonstrate how a small institution that was focused, working with rural, poor rural people, can make a big difference in their lives. And this was basically, basically the message, was, was basically to, to share this message of investment in rural areas and how an institution like IFAD can make it happen. So let me, let me follow from there, investment in agriculture. Julie also talked about one of the four key lessons she took away, the, the, the central role of smallholders. One of your chapters is called Farming as a Business. And you have often said yourself, small farmers are businesses, but these are among the poorest people in the world. So why do you consider it important to approach their development as a business proposition <coughs> rather than as aid or humanitarian relief? And how do you approach as a business proposition? Well, again, here, here, Kevin. Kevin will remember the first time I spoke about agriculture as business in the board. Uh, they laughed at me. <laughs> they laughed. They thought at best, you know, it was like a dream. I was it was really good, but just just a dream, at best. At worst, they thought I was I was stupid. But you see, if you look, think about the agri agri business sector, agri food sector. Currently, it's worth five trillion dollars. Okay, and it's not only just industrial farms, the big farms. If you imagine that the largest portion of our population live in developing countries, and their primary source of income is agriculture, small scale agriculture or smallholder agriculture. And let me quickly say, when I say agriculture, I don't just mean crops. I mean agriculture in its broadest sense. Fisheries, livestock, uh, ruminants and everything. Uh, forestry as well. Of cash crops as well as industrial crops. Now, in Africa in particular, you're looking at a population where 80% of them actually depend on agriculture for their livelihoods. Asia, particularly India, 60%. Now if, when after traveling to rural areas and basically understanding what these populations are trying to do, what just one dollar investment can do in the life of a small rural family, Now, if you put yourself in a situation where you're producing on an annual basis less than one ton per hectare, per hectare on half a hectare of land or half or one acre of land, you have, there are no roads, 
There is no electricity. There is no bank. How do you make profit? Now, here are families who want their children to go to school. And when I realized that basically their activity is an economic activity that is supposed to generate money to feed their families. It's a kind of a business. Whatever the size, the form, the shape. And, and I think if I quickly identified what the constraints were, why are their businesses not successful? And how can we remove those constraints? And this is the key. Like any big business, any big farms, whether it's 100,000 hectares or 20,000 20, hectares or one hectare, it's a business. They all want the same things that you and I enjoy in the big cities. I can tell you that. But governments are not paying attention to them. And this is a, an economic activity, a money-making activity. And once the, we give them the opportunities, they flourish. And I can give you tons and tons of examples. Kevin can tell you, give you, I mean, any one of you here who's been out in the field in rural areas can give you. And I realized that we have to, this is the mantra. Five, two, three years later, I was really, really, fab, 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 what, what is the word for it? Flabbergasted. When Aki Adeshina, who is now president of the Africa Development Bank, took this up. And everywhere he went, agriculture is business. And ministers are saying the same thing today. Now, if it's a business, if you want your business to succeed, you have to invest in your business. And this is the message we're giving to the ministers. And thanks to the uh, oil crash, oil price crash, countries like my country are beginning to realize that they have to get back to agriculture. Can I thank you. I hope that during the Q&A and discussion afterwards, we'll have a chance to also hear from some of the IFAD colleagues in terms of experiences in terms of making farming as a business and are we getting there closer and closer. But I want to continue along this theme and also pick up on a point that Julie had made, which smallholder agriculture is part of the e economic transformation. And I want to come back to your, uh, uh, your, one of the motifs in your life, which is rural development. I want to come back, we are living in a world where we are seeing dramatic transformations around us, different problems around us, climate change, inequality, injustice, that need bold and swift action. And you have been talking about rural development as being central to solving those problems. Could you expand a little bit on that? In this world, rural development, central to solving those big problems? You know, uh, let, me, let me try and be brief because I'm looking, I'm looking at the time. You know, there is no nation, no region of the world that was able to develop itself without going through an agrarian trans transformation. No region. Just look at history. England and Europe in the 18th century, 17th and 18th century. China in the 19th century. Sorry, uh, Japan in the 19th century. China, India, Brazil, 20th century. They all went through this. Agrarian revolution to industrial revolution to advanced nations of the world. Now why should it be different for Africa? It's as simple as this. You know, so there has to be a transformation, and it has to start from the top. And for this to happen, it has to happen in the rural space. Food doesn't grow in cities. They can be made in cities, but they don't grow. And if you want to look at national development in, this right, in, 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 the, in, the, in the correct sense, you have to start for the transformation of rural areas where the food is grown. In some countries, they've talked about uh, a, 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 a agricultural production zones, agricultural processing zones, sort of from production to, to the industrial uh, uh, companies, all situated in the same area. And it's working. <clears throat> now, if that is the premise, now we know that countries, like my country, that have experienced a boom economic boom because of oil. That oil, nobody, oil doesn't feed people. That we know, at least from Nigeria. Nobody eats oil. It only generates wealth into a few pockets and leaves the majority completely destitute and pollutes the land. I can, I can assure you. 
And so going back into transformation, agrarian transformation is going to be very key. If three quarters of the world's population live in rural areas, if 70 to 80 percent of them are farmers and small scale agriculture farmers, we cannot talk about the transformation of a country without the transformation of the rural space. The rural space has to become attractive for young people to make a living. And what you have to understand in this transformation, it creates jobs, it generates wealth, employment, jobs, wealth, and it generates a cohesive society within the rural space. And when people can make a living, when you have all the necessary ingredients, you know, infrastructure, roads, electricity, you name it, schools, clinics, People want to live in rural areas. And that's so the migration will continue to the urban areas as long as we neglect the rural space. And we do that at our own peril. And we can go into other things. I mean, I can tell you this, you know, that you can link the issue of migration to the neglect of investment in rural space and into agriculture. When you see a migrant, you see a man, of, I mean, a young boy or a lady of 18, 19, 20, trying to cross the Mediterranean or the Sahara from Nigeria, from Senegal, from Côte d'Ivoire, not from, not, from, not from the northeast of Nigeria where they have Boko Haram, but from the south. Why are they living in a country of, where there is peace? They're economic migrants looking for better opportunities. They are frustrated. They are destitute because of lack of economic opportunities. And that is why investment in agriculture, investment in rural transformation is key and central to Africa's development. Just continuing the theme for a moment, in your book you talk a lot about your concerns for the youth and you've already expounded on your concerns about the youth. But I would like to ask you one more uh, sort of question along that line. The youth are the ones who are fleeing the rural areas. And, the, and how do you transform rural areas to make that attractive in a world of rapid urbanization? Half the world is already, uh, we're close to two thirds of the world living in urban areas. With rapid urbanization, can we really make rural areas places that youth want to stay or are we kind of going to try and force them to stay there? Well, <clears throat> rap and I, I hear this all the time about projections of about 60% of the world population will live in urban areas by 2030, 2050. But poor people will still remain in rural areas. Okay. And one uh, other thing we should understand when we talk about is rapid urbanization. I don't, see, I don't see it in the same light. I see a rapid expansion of urban slums. That's what you end up with. Nothing but slums where you have people who are frustrated, where it generates a climate of crime, destitution, frustration, and wanting to move out. And from rural to urban, urban to outside, to Europe, for North Africa and West Africa, <clears throat> uh, to, to, the, to, the, to North America, for, for, for Latin America, Australia and the rest from Asia. It will continue to happen. The point here is what, what, what society has succeeded in reversing migration. Let, let's take China. How many years ago? 50 years ago? Maybe 60 years ago? The migration into, to, to Beijing, to, to the big cities in China, was huge. But that was reversed. And I've been to China, to many parts of China, when I was with IFA. And I've seen how incredible things have happened how you had reverse migration. And people talk about, no, they migrate to Beijing, they migrate to the cities. They do that during the off season. Many young men and women migrate to the cities in China in the off season to work. In the crop season, they come back home. They're not permanent migrants because they have a reason to come back and they have making money out of. You see, when you, when you talk about agriculture to young people and they see nothing but a hole in the hands of a woman with a baby on her back, <coughs> They laugh at you, you want me to go do this? But when you tell them, listen, I'm talking about food systems. I'm telling young graduates, you can make money out of just buying and selling. If any of you have traveled in Africa or parts of South Asia, 
you know what happens when this when the crop season is, is on when it's when it's crop season you find mangoes tomatoes onions on the roadside selling a basket for one dollar two weeks after the crop season that basket is going to sell for five dollars to ten dollars i said all you need to do is go to the rural areas buy a small generator which we call in my part of the world uh, i better pass my neighbor and generate yourself electricity between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. in one room. Store all the mangoes, all the oranges, all the tomatoes you can, and start releasing it two weeks, one month later. Package it, wash it properly, package it, slam it with a, a label, go to ShopRite, <laughs> and you can sell them. That's business. You don't have to put the seed in the soil. You don't have to milk the cow to be to be uh, engaged in the food system. Look at IT. What IT can do? IT for d <coughs> or like what Ifpri and if I are working on. Uh, I, I just had a, a, a nice discussion this this week with uh, two of the wonderful ladies in front of me here. What are you trying to do with IT? Agriculture for development. <coughs> and your and the DFI. What is that now? Development. Frontiers. Frontiers. Frontiers something. Frontiers. Exactly. Now, IT, and this one area, <clears throat> All right, let me tell you a story very quickly about a, a visit to, to Cameroon, one of the trips I made when I was at IFAD. We went to this village, and we were, of course, working with women's group, and by the way, they are better managers of resources than men in rural areas. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> Ask my wife about that. <laughs> but really, and this woman who was, who was a spokesperson for this village, for this group, for this women's group, was speaking to the minister who, and, the, and, the, and the parliamentarians that we, we, we went with, and she said, listen, we thank you very much for giving us land to be able to grow our foods, our crops and things, but now we want more than that. We want to be able to use tractors, and we want to be able to sell, so we want a road from this village to Yaoundé, so we can take our produce. The middlemen are coming here and cheating us. We know that we can sell better. And by, all, by, the, by the way, our children also need electricity so they can work, they can have internet. And this is a rural space. Telling the minister and the parliamentarians that they're making money out of growing cassava. And their children want electricity so they can work, they can, they can connect with the rest of the world. That is agriculture we're talking about. Give them the opportunities, raw people can transform themselves and transform the rural space. Now you, I have so many questions I want to ask you, and I'm looking at the time, and if you will allow me to ask you at least one or two more questions. I will talk less. <laughs> no, you will. <laughs> but uh, you, have, uh, you just started to talk about women, and in your book, you have asked the question, and I will repeat it here for us. What would the world look like if we close the gender gap? Uh, lessons again from IFAD projects. <laughs> um, it would be a different world. There's no question about it. You know, there's a study by McKinsey recently, uh, which showed that, uh, sorry, there's, there's, there's a recent study by McKinsey, uh, which, which showed, if I can find it, um, right, a McKinsey report recently in 2015, that equality in the workplace could add 12 trillion to global GDP. 12 trillion. But I want to quickly add, and I've said this before in other, in other forums, gender is not only unique to women. When we talk about gender, we're talking about both men and women. I think we need to change our mindset here. I make a clear distinction between gender and empowerment of women. They are two, two separate things. In our projects, there are many instances where we found that Trying to introduce technologies to women because they are the majority of farmers sometimes doesn't work until you get the men involved. <clears throat> Telling women to plant particular crops or tree crops doesn't often work because the men immediately say you are taking their land from them. Planting a tree means ownership of land. So you have to have men involved in it. And one study that if I'd started, one, one process if I started just before Kevin left is this, uh, uh, um, what do we call it again? The household, household methodologies, where 
was basically sitting with families, or at least husband and wife, and trying to analyze the various duties or responsibilities of the house and trying to share it. And we found when you did this, and when each one identified their roles and how important the role of the other was, you begin to see increases in, increases in household income, even with, with children as well as you know uh, relations. And this household methodology is basically is talking to people. And one thing which I almost forgot to, to mention is that, I think you, you did mention it, Julie, um, development is not something that we do for people. And we all, we all make that mistake. Now we're going, to, we're going to develop this country. We have to develop this community. No. People develop themselves. Development is not something that you do for or to people. Development is something people do for themselves. Our role, our business, we as international development community, is to facilitate it, is to help them, is to support them, is to catalyze them. They know what to do. We just want to help them to do it. Kanayo, on that front, let me slightly change the topic. I mean, as a fellow African, you know, I was very much moved by a sentence in his book, I grieve for the untapped potential for Africa. And as a Kenyan woman, I grieve too with you. And I see that. And let me ask you, what do we need to do? What do we need to do differently to unlock this potential for Africa? You've been talking about it. But is there a role that science, technology, policy, innovation can play for that? We're sitting at Desbury. We know about rural transformation. We know about things. What can we do to really unlock this potential for Africa and for African people? I don't want to talk about Africa's potential because it makes me cry. Because Africa has wasted its potential. One thing I've, I've, I've said to politicians and I've said to my colleagues of my age, my generation has failed. And one thing we have done successfully is failure. <laughs> we have, su ex we have success successfully failed every time. Just look at Africa. That's what we've done successfully. Now, a continent as rich as Africa, I can give you the list of Africa's wealth. No other continent has our wealth. Not to talk about land, which is 60% of uncultivated agricultural land. Not talk of minerals, from diamond to cobalt to gold to magnesium and so on and so forth. Not to talk about oil. 15% of all oil deposit is in Africa, sub Saharan Africa. I'm not talking about North Africa. We squandered it. What is the problem? Leadership. It's as simple as that. No matter how, no matter how much aid money you put into a country, Without leadership, you are wasting your time. Leadership that builds institutions. Without institutions, nothing works. And that is a lesson we have to learn. Look at countries where it is working. I'll just give you two. Rwanda, Ethiopia. It's leadership. You may say it's not democratic. It depends on how you define democracy. It is working. It is working because the leaders have put in place institutions. And hopefully, they don't become institutions themselves, like you have in Uganda. Because when they are no longer there, there the country crumbles. They have to build institutions. That's very key. I think that's key number, answer to, uh, uh, to, to your question. <clears throat> But what should we do, those of us who are in this business? And I always give this, I use an anecdote to explain. If you believe in what you're doing, and you believe with, in it, with a passion, then you are convinced about what you're doing. And you are like a ladder, and your legs are poised solidly in the ground based on your conviction. As a ladder, you must provide your back for people following you to climb. If they cannot climb to the top of the ladder, which is your shoulder, they cannot see beyond your vision. And that's what we have to do. And that's what every leader has to do. If people can only see your back, they cannot see through you. So we must use everything. Some of us have been 
are gifted, have been so lucky in life. We accumulated a wealth of experiences. We have to be able to give that back. And only, the only way we can do that is by helping others to do better than we have done. We talk about youth, we say, tomorrow, the youth are our leaders of tomorrow. I said, no, they are our leaders of today because tomorrow starts today. Today was tomorrow, yesterday. <laughs> so that tomorrow is, is now. And that should never postpone until tomorrow. <clears throat> so in many ways, I think if we can get our leadership problem straightened in Africa, which is going to be difficult, but I think that the upcoming generation is actually sick and tired of the current leadership. And I can see it. Their movements say things have to change. We cannot continue this way. Until you have that straightened. Because without institutions, I mean, if you think about, just, just take one example, tax evasion. I'm not talking about tax evasion by, by citizens of a country. The businesses that evade. The businesses that come, they get governments, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, waivers for the first five years so they establish themselves and there are no taxes. They take all of that money out of the country. They are not paying taxes. Five years later, the company closes and they open another one. And that's how they're siphoning trillions of dollars out of these countries. Why? We have no institutions to collect and to redistribute the tax. It's as simple as that. Without institutions, whether it's a policy dimension, without institutions, no matter what policies you have, they will not work. 